Okay, hey everyone, it's Pleasant, and I'm here today with my friend Jen O'Sullivan. Say hey, Jen. Hi. And we're going to jam on something I'm super excited to learn more about because I've seen you post about it, and I'm like, ooh, that sounds like I would be really into it and right up my alley. So you've been learning about internal family systems mm -hmm. yep. and studying. Tell us a little bit about what it is and why it's so awesome. <clears throat> Well, the first thing I wanted to say was, you're right. Every I was sitting in class all last year, and we'd be sitting there, and I'd go, "Oh man, Pleasance needs to be here." <laughs> you're kind of like my 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 friend who who's into this stuff when most people are not. <laughs> so I, I was like, "Oh, I wish Pleasance was here." So I'm glad we're getting to chat. Um, so internal family systems is actually a psychotherapy model, and you know, you and I both are very into um, psychology and how we can integrate that into uh, more spiritual practices. And it was my yoga teacher, Sarah Powers, who, who sent me in that direction. So I didn't know anything about IFS until I signed up for the course. I mean, that's not entirely true. I knew a little. Um, so it was a learning process for me as well, just kind of getting the lay of the land because I don't, I'm not a therapist. Um, I haven't been to, I, I took one Psych 101 class in college and everything else has been what I call experiential learning <laughs> and, um, uh, and just my own investigation. But um, so internal family systems is a model for psychotherapy. And I, I didn't realize going into it that um, there's lots of different models and people subscribe to um, different uh, perspectives on, on how therapy should unfold and what to expect during the process, how to prompt it and cue it, and, and what to do when certain things come up. So this is a perspective on how to do therapy work um, that I think has a, has a lot of commonality with the things that we talk about in yoga and um, Buddhist teachings as well. So I've, uh, it's it's a really good compliment to that work. And it's based around the premise that um, <clears throat> when we're born, um, we have a core aspect of our being that uh, the founder of IFS, uh, Richard Schwartz, calls self, um, which is untouched by, uh, you know, all the kinds of things that happen to us as we grow older. And so when I cross-reference this, um, through the through the yoga vocabulary, we're really talking about something like Atman and you know what happens when we go through life and we accumulate some scars. And so um, from this this psychotherapy model, we have this core self and it has these beautiful qualities and attributes like compassion and creativity, and confidence and connection. So all of these wonderful qualities that we would we would hope that we could maintain, but as we move through our life, through the events that unfold, um, especially when we're really young and we aren't as able to access that core self, we develop um, different aspects of our personality that help us to live and cope with life in the world. And some of those tend to be um, really useful. Um, so these aren't negative things per se. Um, you know, our ability to learn and go to school uh, go to jobs, uh, manage our lives, you know, everything from self-care to uh, the bills and project management, all the things that we need to do to show up and live in the world, those are parts of us. And so we would call those manager parts. And we all have them. Um, you know, you and I talking right now, um, this is a, these are manager parts interacting with one another. Um, you know, the, the part of me that's really on top of all the bills, that's a part, you know, things like that. Um, so these are the things that help us function in life. Um, ideally, we still have access to self and this kind of calm, centered way of being to kind of guide the process like a, maybe like a CEO or something of a, of a big organization, drawing on information that's coming in from these manager parts, but ultimately that the, the decisions in your life come from a heart-centered place, right? Mm -hmm. um, but of course, what happens is sometimes terrible things happen, or not even like capital T terrible things, but little t traumas can come up as well. And um, so we develop other parts that are, are wounded. 
by those things that come up in our life. And if they happen when we're really young and we're not well resourced, um, then we do the best that we can and we develop parts that um, try to manage those feelings in the only way that they know how. And so then we've got, we develop these other managers whose only purpose in life seems to be to prevent those feelings from ever coming up again. And then we have other managers that are at the ready for when those feelings do arise and we would call those firefighters. And so these, these two parts kind of work in tandem to keep this wounded, unprocessed part um, kind of buried so that we can still continue to show up and, and live in the world. Um, those buried parts uh, in the IFS lexicon are called exiles because we try to hide them away and pretend that not, they're not there and we show up. And so a lot of, um, a lot of how we show up in life is really fueled and motivated by um, how these parts interpret the things that are happening to us and the kinds of things that we need to um, you know, manage not only the day-to-day, -day, but also how much additional wounding we perceive might come up. Um, so it, you know, I don't know if you want me to get into examples. I'm quite happy to share some of yeah, my own yeah, work. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, but, you know, through my own work with IFS, uh, and you and I have talked a little bit about this um, at other times about some of these issues that I personally have had around showing up and, and doing some of the marketing stuff in my business and just trying to put myself out there. And, you know, there's certainly an, an inner critic and a little bit of imposter syndrome. But through this work with IFS, I've come to really respect that it's a lot more complicated than just grade B <laughs> imposter syndrome because I've uncovered the wounded part that is so frightened about putting myself out there. And it's a legitimate part of my childhood. My, I was about third grade, so I was at eight or nine years old. Um, and I had an adult in my life that radically failed me and, and um, did some really hurtful things in public forums. And so it's no wonder that showing up in public is terrifying. And I, may, I have a manager, I, I, I'm motioning back here because a lot of times we perceive managers kind of in relation to our physical body. So I have this manager back here behind my head it's always kind of going, well, but Jen, you need to do this stuff because it's going to be good for your business and you're going to, you know, more people are going to come to your programs and blah, blah, blah. And so I can, I have that kind of motivational part that kind of pushes me through. But then I'm like, why do I feel so crappy after I, you know, I'm able to push through, but I still feel bad. And, and it's because that wound is still there and it's unprocessed. So I have, I have managers that are like, don't send the newsletter. Don't send the newsletter. It's too painful. It's too painful. <laughs> the other managers are like, yeah, yeah, you got to send the newsletter. And then meanwhile, I've got the third one that's over here going, all right, when you send the newsletter, you're going to feel like crap. So what are we going to do that? And that's my firefighter. And luckily, you know, me through all the work I've done through yoga and Buddhist practice and mindfulness, I have good resources to fall back on when I feel bad. But you can also see why if you don't, you're going to turn to the first thing that seems to work. Maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's shopping, maybe it's eating, and they work. And that's why we do them. They do short term make us feel better, but, you know, it's only going to be a band-aid until that, that pain comes back up. And so it's been really interesting to me to see how I respond. And at, at one point when I was in high school, I had this... Um, I call it the FU part because <laughs> it was my rabble that wore dark clothes and shaved my head and was like, I'm not even going to go there with all of you people. <laughs> and it was in response to, it was another way of me just not even trying because it was too painful. Yeah. So it's been fascinating to see how this works out. And so now I can, I, I, it's not, my work is not done, but I'm able to, um, understand myself better and what, what what's underlying all these motivations and it's you know inquiry I think is really the biggest and it also happens to be the first step so um so hopefully this kind of paints the picture um a little bit <laughs> I think what's really interesting about it that I know I definitely want to it's on my list now of like things to explore a little bit more mm -hmm. 
um, as again, just sort of more tools for our community and my own life first, of course, and then also being able to give tools and systems that are helpful to clients and women in, in our community because I do find that sometimes, you know, with the big leap, um, I wrote about the big leap a few years ago. I definitely always tell people to read it because it, it really does give you the language and the framework around limiting beliefs, around what upper limiting is. So you can kind of get in the pattern and habit of seeing when that's happening, right? And then mm -hmm. imposter syndrome is right along with that, right? And we were talking, you were talking about this a little bit already, but there's sort of this like, and then what <laughs> that comes up now. I, because of all the training and just the weirdo that I am, weird and wonderful, is that I'm really good at being able to pull that apart naturally and do that deep dive in the journal. My background is in psych and soch, so that to me is very normal looking. And then the Ayurveda on top of it is like I see everything through the doshas now or the five elements. So it's, I can kind of pinpoint that intuitively. However, when I'm working with people or trying to help people do that for themselves, they can't use my intuition. I can't give them my <laughs> intuition. And there can be a little bit of a block of just saying, you have to do this for yourself, but not really being able to fully give them the tools to do it at this point. So this to me sounds very interesting as a way to learn and deepen common language and give more of those tools that people can really use to help themselves with that inquiry. And it sounds like that's what you've done in your own life is be able to identify. It's almost like having those personas, right? And the namings that really help us get out of that specific situation with I, 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 or me, 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 which is about to imbalance and being able to process it through and digest it from a larger perspective. Yeah. And I, I think to carry that a little bit, um, just to pick up your ball and run with it a little bit, yeah. the language that we use in IFS to talk about these different parts is we say, part of me feels like this, mm. or I have parts that feel like that. And it's, it's that. a little bit weird at first. It doesn't come naturally until then it does. And, it, and it's like we're giving voice to these parts of ourselves that sometimes we're not even very proud of, but it also kind of normalizes totally. that we have conflicting motivations all the time all the time um, yeah and, and it's so such that, important i love that so much because we talk about this all the time especially in parenting well in parenting i would say in every area of my life parenting business marriage <laughs> on one hand there's this and on the other hand there's this and i feel this and i feel this right holding those seemingly opposing because we're constantly putting like motherhood is either good or sucky, right? Or running a business is awesome or exhausting. Like we don't go deeper with those layers. So I love that. The part of me feels yes. like this, yeah. And in IFS, they talk about parts being polarized against one another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the manager that's very proactive is doing all this work and then you've got a firefighter that's reactive. Or, or you could have other managers that just have different perspectives on how things could go. And the trick when you start working with those polarizations is you kind of have to work with them in tandem. Because if one starts to give a little, then the other one will tend to flare up. So it's, it's a kind of interesting balancing act when you're dealing with um, these conflicting or especially really, really polarized parts that are way on the opposite end of the scale. Mm -hmm. um, Do you have an example of one that you went through or that comes up for you if you think about Um, let me see. Um, I definitely just to go back to the example that I was talking about earlier, there's the, um, you know, the part of me that thinks it's important for me to, you know, write another blog post or do all of those kinds of things. Um, and then there's the part of me that's like, but you're just going to get you know, somebody's going to see this and you're going to be just rolled, <laughs> but I have to do it is over here, but you're going to get rolled over here. <laughs> and so they do, they do volley. And, yeah. and I may, I usually side with the one that says I have to do it. Um, yeah. But I don't feel good at the end of it. Yeah. And so 
um, that's the that's the price that you pay when yeah. you're doing when you're pushing against something that needs a different kind of um, help than than what you were um, previously doing. And and I think the biggest thing for me because um, we talked about this a little bit. I have a child with anxiety and I don't have anxiety and it's a really um, odd thing for me. And, and um, you know, early on before we knew what was going on, we'd say, you know, we try to logic her way out of it and try to yeah. reason. You don't have to feel that way. It's okay. Everything's fine. You know, nothing's going to happen. And then, <laughs> and then through this discovery of figuring out how to be with a person with anxiety and parent want a child that way, like you can't logic your way out of it. It's a feeling. It's coming from within you. And I think about the same way as this, this part that's like constantly like pushing, 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 pushing. The other part's like, you don't get it. You don't get it. This is, this is more than me just pushing through. Yeah. And, um, and so I'm not sure if that's the best example. I don't have at the moment strongly polarized parts, but I do feel this volleying between yeah. got to do for my life and my business and doesn't feel good. Yeah. And having to do it anyway. Well, and I think it's so much more than that because, I mean, I think it's like, again, like there's a lot of different ways that it could appear based on the situation and the human involved because it could literally be that masculine and feminine energy just dancing with one another, right? Like the feminine being like, we don't have to do all of this stuff that we think we have to do. And the masculine being like, yes, we do. Check off the list. What did you do today? You must accomplish, right? And so there's that natural sort of dance that's happening. Mm -hmm. But also there's the pattern and the habit of being yourself, right? Which is the whole idea that um, they're going to do, they're going to say this about me, or if I do this, then I'll get rolled or I'll get embarrassed. And then sort of the, the inquiry underneath that, that I'm using a lot lately, that's just been so powerful in my own work and uh, in Lola especially is, okay, so can you deal with that? Right. Is like, so here, if this is the, if this is the thing that's going to happen, not with a punishing, not with like fist up, but really soft, like, okay, baby, can you deal with that? Like, can you deal with someone? I just had this with a friendship. Right. And I noticed all this back and forth and fear of uh, not having her approval of wanting to know what she's thinking, um, watching sort of 20 years of a friendship pattern play out. Um, where I've been really trying to please her for a long time and done a good job of it. Now that I'm not doing a good job of it, how do I feel about that? And the habit wants to keep fixing it, mm. right? The mind says, like, let it go. It's getting a little defensive and like, it's not up to you to do everything. Like, let her come to, you know, kind of like getting a little bit of armor. But the question underneath it is like, okay, so someone doesn't like you. Like, mm -hmm. how are you dealing with that? And what's been arising is this clarity of strength that I've never tapped into where she kind of says like, you're okay, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've never given myself an opportunity to allow someone to be upset with me and sit with that. Because mm -hmm. the habit and the masculine has gone in and fixed it all the time. So now underneath that layer is like, okay, so if someone writes a bad comment online or someone gets upset with you, like, how can you handle that? Right? Like, and that mm -hmm. for me has been really interesting to continue growth. Cause I think mm -hmm. people like you and I, who are lifelong seekers and we love to learn and we love to help people and ourselves. And like, that's always what we're going to be doing. There, has, there, there continues to be like sort of underneath and underneath and underneath, which keeps it fresh and alive. And I actually think the sort of sign for good, uh, for um, like the best, in my, in my view, the best teachers are the best students. They're just perpetual, they're just always students, right? Like Eric Schiffman always says like, I'm teaching from the current level of my ignorance. <laughs> and this is my current level of understanding. It may be really ignorant in a few years, but here's what I'm currently learning, right? 50 years into teaching yoga, he's still studying with teachers and questioning and changing stuff he used to teach. Cats are always welcome on the show. Um, <laughs> you see the tail. So, be a distraction. <laughs> so, um, so that's my point is that like, okay, people who are listening, you've got to a point where you understand that you can have seemingly opposing feelings. You're watching yourself volley. You're watching yourself present this thing. Underneath that will continue to be more choices about how you work with her and how you work with that language and how you work with those questions. 
if people are listening and they're like, okay, this sounds really interesting, but I certainly don't need one more thing. <laughs> yeah. Where should we start? How should, like, how can we start to look or put some of these pieces into real life and into our um, day-to-day relationships? <clears throat> one of the things, you can do this in a meditation practice, so that is definitely um, a lot of ways that people practice Mm -hmm. IFS as a self practice, that was actually quite interesting to me that a lot of the people in my training who were already familiar with IFS um, Mm -hmm. do do practice it like you and I practice yoga. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Um, Pull this guy up. Okay. Um, So you can do that. And, And it's a lot of inquiry work. And it's not that dissimilar from like a Vipassana meditation where you're just kind of resting in what's present and oftentimes the doorway in is somatic so you might be sitting in you know a comfortable seat or even lying down or you know it's it's really informal you can sit in a chair with IFS mm-hmm. or you know sit on your couch you don't have to be in a posture um you know and you, you start to say you know what's what's present for me right now mm-hmm. and what what feelings are present with me in my body and you just start to you know if there's a strong physical somatic sensation happening in the body then that's where you start perhaps and you can say okay um you know what does this look like what does this feel like what is this trying to tell me and a question um you know the 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 therapy when you're doing it with a practitioner or a therapist is a, a series of questions that the that the person in the role of the therapist will start to to ask you to help you tease out but when you're doing it on your own it's you kind of asking yourself the questions like what is this what do i need to know right now what is this feeling telling me you can go the other way if you have something that you're you're working with and um you know an, an issue that you're trying to puzzle through you can you can kind of sit bring up thoughts and feelings around that issue feel that in your body where does that feel and so you know as an example um a lot of people will feel like pressure on their chest around certain issues or i get a lot of parts when they get up they they push down on my shoulders like they're weighing me down or Mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like you're blank like even a sense of blankness is is an inquiry in and of itself if you feel like you're just cut off well what's that what's going on there and so you just kind of, you know, you want to get curious. And when you can get curious, that's when you're accessing self. Um, and you want to be open hearted. That's also self energy. And in IFS lingo, they call that being self led. And so mm-hmm. if you can just get curious and, and relax a little bit and just kind of invite the, the questions, like, what do I need to know? It's kind of like you, what you were describing before. If you are working with, you know, I've got these parts that are up underneath that usually it's some kind of exiled part that is is the one that's being protected and you can start to drill in with particular managers um, very similar to the the sentence that you put out um, a question would be what would happen if mm-hmm. so what would happen if i you know did x that that makes me scared okay well then I, this this and this will happen okay well what happens if that that and that happens and you eventually drill down and you will eventually uncover the root. And, um, and then you can work with that root. There's a whole method, especially when working with a practitioner or therapist of um, doing what's called unburdening that exile. So, you know, it is a therapy model. So eventually you could, you could get to the healing of those wounded parts. And then when that happens, ideally, the managers settle down and they take on a less extreme job. Yeah. So. And like name it to tame it, right? Like anything is like, you have to work with it. And then it most of the time releases in some way or dissolves the intensity of their duration. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not going to go away forever. Always exclamation point. Now you're done. Cross it off the list. Like this is part of the human experience is the repeating wounds and the repeating patterns. And I know that in my own repeating wounds and patterns now I... I don't laugh when they come. I just smile. I'm like, oh, hello, familiar. You know, hello. Yeah. Like, hello, welcome, welcome back. <laughs> like something yeah. is happening where I'm pushing on either a new way of being or sharing or living or, you know, um, we were just doing in Lola this month, we're doing intuition and we've, we're using part of a 
Tara Sophia Moore's playing big and the principle of the different versions of fear um, that she writes about in the book, which are, you can have fear that is tangible, like I'm afraid my kid will run in the street and get killed. And then there's a fear of living your purpose with divine, right? Which is um, really, which is part of the integration of spirit and soul and ego sort of coming together. And it sounds to me like this system and learning some of this language and especially the questions help us with that fear of tapping into purpose. Would you say that that would be useful um, to people? Like, I don't know how to help. I mean, have you ever worked with that or thought about that yourself as you've continued to do your work and practice and um, expand? How's that worked for you? Kind of, kind of. Um, my last session with my my coach my ifs coach because i'm seeing a coach and not a therapist <laughs> um yeah. is uh we did we did some of that kind of work i think as you're describing um and it started it, it doesn't really start with the inquiry you think you're gonna get mm -hmm. so i started with um you know i'm launching a new part of my my work and I don't, I need to figure out who my clients are. And I had some fear up around, um, you know, around with IFS, like, what if I end up with somebody who really needs a therapist and not somebody with my level of training and education. And that actually did tease out some, some purpose, more existential purpose driven stuff for sure. And I didn't, I, I didn't go into that inquiry thinking that's where it was going to be. Yeah. But if you just keep asking the question, well, what's going to happen if, what's going to happen if, mm -hmm. and, um, and then you're, then you, you uncover um, some of those really core existential fears that, you know, are motivating you at a, at a kind of subconscious level until you shine the light on them. And then when you shine the light, it's so, for me, it's very freeing, though I, I want to I wanna hold space for the people who might find it scary to see what's there, yeah. um, you know, because as far as I've uncovered, I don't have any capital T trauma in my life, and I'm, I'm very cognizant of that privilege. Um, so many people have a lot of terrible things that they haven't confronted, and so I don't want it to sound like everything's great when you yeah, look yeah. inside the, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. um, But for me, it's been, um, at least the level of stuff I've been working with has been, has been really, it's, it's like it gives it a lot of space and room to breathe. Um, I think a lot about, um, my teacher always talks about holding um, your thoughts and your feelings in spacious, open-hearted awareness. So that image comes up a lot for me when I'm doing IFS work that we're, we're giving, breathing room to all these parts of ourselves that sometimes we're embarrassed by even ashamed by we we chastise parts of ourselves for the things that they do but at the end of the day everything that's going on in our internal system is is doing what it thinks is the best thing for yeah. us and yeah. that's actually um really moving to me even the like parts that are not that i'm not proud of are doing the best that they can to help me <laughs> And um, so I think that's one of the ways that this has been um, really valuable work. It does feel like, you know, meditation, you know, you cover, you know, uncover some stuff and you're Vipassana meditation and then you're like, well, what now? Like, am I just supposed to stay here with it? <laughs> and so it's worth having some more tools to, to dig in a little bit more and, and, and open that spaciousness out a little bit more. Oh, for sure. Do you think, um, I want to know, what did you guys learn or talk about with inner critic? Because we did a little bit of imposter syndrome just in terms of talking about that and, and questions. But what about inner critic? Yeah, so inner critic would be another part. And um, I would say with 90% confidence that everybody has an inner critic <laughs> and everybody's inner critic might show up a little bit different way. But it's, this, it's the same process with these different parts of ourselves. You know, what do you, 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 with that inner critic, you're trying to get underneath what's, what's the motivating factor here. Usually, because it's a manager, it's trying to protect you from stepping into something that it thinks you can't handle. 
And so it's going to do whatever method it can come up with. If, it, if talking you out of it isn't going to work, then berating you is something over time that you've learned. And you might have picked it up from other people too, because when we're young, we pick up our behavioral patterns from the people in our life, right? So, uh, but it, at some point in our life, that inner critic stopped you from doing something that would have exasperated a wound or you know, kept the wound open. And so, and it just becomes a habit. Well, this works, so I'm just gonna keep doing it. And, and then, we, it, then we think it's who we are, but it's really just a part. Mm -hmm. Like any other part. So, how's yeah. that fitting with you? <laughs> yeah, good. I'm just thinking about it in terms of like self compassion, obviously, and sort of like the ways that we've been working with it a lot this year. Um, and again, I think it's an area that once we even know there's that language of inner critic or inner mentor or whose voice is there, um, it's a powerful awakening to possibility. And again, not that there's that then you're free and it's all like positive and wonderful. Um, I will say that going back a little bit to the trauma piece too, with a capital T trauma, that um, in my experience, really, um, identifying it, working with it, talking, writing about it, and being really um, as honest as I can, you know, it's interesting lately, I feel like I can be, I could be more honest with myself in some of the stories in my past journals and things like that, that I've been going through because I'm in the process of figuring out how to write about some of these traumas with a capital T because it, uh, I'm not sure why it's just something I feel like called to do, but <laughs> it's part of that whole Dharma thing. Um, but I'm saying that because what I find is that with these uh, levels of support and tools, it's, it is scary to shine a light on them, but it is the tr it's like such a powerful healing and freeing and authenticity and owning your story and owning the past. I think we're moving into a time, at least definitely with who I spend time listening and learning and reading from, where we're sh changing the narrative on the darkness and creating, we're just kind of rippling out like dominoes, these stories of transformation as a way to uplift and rise up our brothers and sisters who feel like the other. And in fact, I just did a podcast with my mom for Mother's Day. And one of the things we talked about was this like what happens when we share our stories and how that mm -hmm. encourages other people to share their stories. Mm -hmm. And we're in a, in a time when we're doing that. And I think having the sort of fame of Brene Brown, right? And, and I feel like Brene's work is so in line with internal family system. Again, it gives you like more to work with. That's, yeah. that's a little bit more personal than just kind of sometimes the blanketing stuff that she does. Are there any, would, is there anything you feel like whether in, in any of your other studies, yoga or Vedic tradition or Buddhism, that wasn't a line or anything that was really new for you or that you didn't agree with, like anything that kind of had you really chewing on? Hmm. Let's see. I, I think that... I have not encountered in my, in my, I think sometimes, hmm, so I'm going way back, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just yeah. kind of, um, one of the reasons why I turned to yoga in the first place was because somebody happened to tell me that it was helping with their mental stuff. Uh, it happened to be around rock climbing and the mental game around that, but I made the connection almost immediately. Mental stuff. Oh, that sounds interesting. Cause I was going through a lot of trouble. What was not working for me. And I've heard um, Bo Forbes talk about this too. Um, talk therapy was not helping. Like the rehashing it and the reliving yes, it yes. with no end in sight was not, it was just like, why are we still talking about this? <laughs> And then the other thing that didn't help at the time was go to the gym. People always feel better after they exercise. <laughs> and let me tell you, I have parts that are like, oh yeah, we can do this on the treadmill. We totally. can do this while you're lifting the weights. Like <laughs> that inner critic at that time in my life, talk about inner critic was 
very, very strong. And, and what, for whatever reason, the tools that I was learning in that yoga class, definitely not every other yoga class I've encountered, but that particular yoga class was, um, it, it got that break. I got it. I got an opportunity to, the, the inner critic stepped back. <coughs> other parts of me came forward that had been completely shut out by this inner critic. And I was able to access other parts of myself that had been dormant. And I think that's another, I, th that was a long time ago, way before IFS, but if I were to put it in IFS terminology now, I would say, um, you know, it's that idea of, of just getting to know the landscape. And, and when you get to know the landscape, you're gonna uncover some turns and twists that, you, that might be actually beneficial and you've just forgotten about them because everything else has been over here for so long um, in this darker place. Um, so yeah, talk therapy didn't work. Just going to the gym didn't work. It took somatic practices to to help me. That was my doorway in. Yeah. But I bet everybody has a different doorway depending on yeah. their constitution and yeah. their history. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Is that that I had a very a similar experience? Is like I was going to the gym for a long time and I kept hurting myself. And when I would go to the gym, I would be. I remember this so well. I would come in after the classroom after I was teaching. And I would have my Us Weekly with my headphones to listen to the music, and I would be drinking Diet Coke on the treadmill or the elliptical, right? And I would like read, read, listen, drink the Diet Coke, be watch at the, the gym, watch the TV. <laughs> I'd be at the gym and I'd leave and be like, why don't I feel better? <laughs> I'm doing what they say, I'm going to the gym. Right. So like, and yeah. I was in therapy at the time too. So it was very funny, like very funny. It was an acupuncturist who started to pull some of that, those pieces apart. My allergies were terrible and I was a mess, a mess, a mess. I was so, 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 so sick. And mm -hmm. it was an acupuncturist that started the whole, like pulling apart slowly, asking real, like just different kinds of questions that I'd ever heard before. And um, and yeah, like at a certain point, the talk therapy, I kept moving therapist, but then I have to keep rehashing the story mm -hmm. and I couldn't figure out, I was like, but I'm supposed to be in therapy. Like I got to deal with my stuff, but then I would have to go and just retell the story. And at the time that the like psychotherapy at that time was just listen and take notes. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's how there was no CBT. Like I was not exposed to CBT. I was not exposed mm -hmm. to any interaction. They just sat mm -hmm. there. And would like nod at me. And then I would leave and be like, I'm doing all the things. Why do I, why are my relationships so bad? You know, why do I, I'm so angry with everyone and I can't tolerate anything. And I, and I don't even know that I had the maturity to like say that, but that's how I felt. I mean, I kept going because I was so angry, you know? So I just think it's really interesting where, so to wrap up, Jen, where can people like, are you going to, tell me what your path is with this now. Tell everyone about um, the other offerings that you have and where we can learn more about you and IFS. Um, so pretty soon, once the summer starts, I'm going to open up some spots for one-on-one -on -one work okay. for people who want to do IFS. Um, and that's not, I don't know when you're going to publish this, but it's not up on my website yet, but uh -huh. hopefully it will be soon. <laughs> um, but I have, I have a few things that I need to wrap up before I, I launch that. Um, but probably late June. Okay. And I'll open a couple of spots up a week. Um, and other than that, I'm a yoga and mindfulness teacher. <laughs> and I, I focus on um, quieter inner method work centered in yin yoga, but not exclusively. And, um, you know, I really like, I think my life path as it's starting to become clear is, is helping to resource people. Mm -hmm. um, using methods that have, have worked for me and I see work well with other people and just giving people tools so that we can lean into, not just cope with the world that we live in and actually, you know, survive and thrive, as they say. So my website is um, sati.yoga, S-A-T-I dot yoga. I know that doesn't sound like a URL, but it, it will get you there. <laughs> um, I'll link it too in the anchor. Um, do you, who do you feel like is a good candidate for the one-on-ones? 
That's a good question because this, this is part of the work I was doing. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not. I, I, that's a yeah. So I'm, um, you know, because of my background in yoga and stuff, I I probably am best to work with people who have a spiritual lean mm -hmm. and are looking for that kind of, um, you know, who've been maybe meditating for a little while and are getting a little bit stuck or are not really seeing where it's going. I think that this kind of work with someone like me at the level that I've been trained is is the kind of work that I would be really helpful for. Um, let's see. And, you know, people who, who are, you know, the, the kind of people that are interested in, in things like Brene Brown kind of says, how do I really step into my life in a, in a way that I feel like I'm, I'm living it and I'm in, I'm in, you know, can make sense of it and can to some extent chart my own course. I'm not going to say control it because we can't do that, but we can certainly um, push it in certain directions that are a little, um, that feel better to us. So those are the kinds of things that, um, that interest me and the kind of work that I've um, found really inspiring through this model. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I'm super excited to keep my studies going after Ayurveda school. I have a list. <laughs> I'm not allowed to take on anything else in the current season. Yeah. I always have to express the boundaries, right? I know. For my, I know. Own, my own well-being. Um, to remind <laughs> myself, don't sign up this week. Um, yeah. And one of the things that I love about you is your wicked intelligence and brilliance and combined so beautifully with the foundation of spirituality and practices and rooted in that inquiry, this wonderful blend of masculine and feminine, which I'm really, I really honor in you and love women who have the passion on both sides, right? For continuing to study and also contributing in a creative way, in a kind way, in a gentle way. And so thank you for bringing your whole self to us today and introducing me to this model and to all of us. So thank you, dear You're Jeff. Welcome. Thank you, Pleasant. It's been great to chat with you. You too. See you soon, I hope. Mm -hmm. Bye, honey. <laughs>